or good afternoon to everybody. Depends on which part of the world you're uh, joining us today from. My name is Praveen Joseph. Um, I'm a cybersecurity consultant, cybersecurity trainer, who's uh, been a part of Ingram Micro Cybersecurity for quite some time now. And I'm very, very happy to welcome you today to uh, today's episode of Ingram Micro's ongoing CISSP trainings. Now, today we are going to talk about a very, very interesting module or domain, so to speak, which is what we call asset security. Now, before I jump into the slides and jump into the content of today's training itself, I'd like to begin with a short introduction to ourselves, who is Ingram Micro. And I'd also like to introduce you to CISSP itself because where I'm very sure you are very, very keen on sitting for the exam. You probably already are on your preparation journey, or maybe you're in the later stages of preparation. Your exam date has even been scheduled. So uh, nevertheless, I will just give you a very high level introduction to CISSP. And then we will jump into section three, where we will look at the domain. What is asset security? Who is Ingram Micro Cybersecurity? Ladies and gentlemen, Ingram Micro, we are the largest technology distributor on the planet. $50 billion company with uh, 35,000 plus employees and uh, pretty much any country in the world, we have operations, we have a footprint. We have offices in uh, 50 plus countries around the world, by the way. This building here, this beautiful building is our um, Dubai campus located in Internet City. Now, when I mentioned technology distributor, many of you may not be familiar with what a distributor does. Um, that is not the uh, core context for today's discussion, so I will not jump into the details. Nevertheless, let me mention that Ingram Micro is not just a tech distributor. We are an advanced solutions provider, which means there is a lot of innovative solutions across different different fields like cybersecurity, cloud, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, um, as well as physical security. A lot of in-house innovation that we are driving. And in fact, we call this office here um, Innovation Hub. Um, when you drive down Alpha Lock Street, if you just look to your right side, um, opposite the Cisco building, you will see this, this uh, office of ours. Now, um, I, I do apologize. There's some um, background noise from kids outside my house. What is it that we offer um, as our solutions from cybersecurity? When it comes to cybersecurity, Ingram Micro offers solutions that cut across the three primary pillars of any information systems ecosystem, people, processes, as well as technologies. For people, we offer a holistic set of trainings. And today you're sitting in one of our most popular trainings, which is a CIS speed training. For processes, we have a lot of consultancy uh, services that we offer, technical assessments, managed security services, which we deliver through our security operations center, centers, by the way. And uh, from the technology standpoint, we are a tech distributor, and pretty much any major cybersecurity window that you can think of in the world, we are already distributing them. So this is what I wanted to mention to you very briefly about Ingram Micro Cybersecurity. Now let's understand what is CISSP all about. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I when I sat for this exam eight years ago, it was one of the most difficult, one of the most respected cybersecurity certifications to exist. Today it is 2020, and the same holds true even today. It is the most respected certification for a cybersecurity or information security professional to hold. If you know, if you have passed this exam, it means that you know something about every dif different domain of information security or cybersecurity. It's for that reason that we say CISSP is an inch deep and a mile wide. You touch upon every domain of cybersecurity, but it does not go deep inside these domains. The exam is very, very difficult. Let's be let's be honest about it. It's not a mean feat if you have cleared this exam. It used to be six hours um, just up to two years ago, but recently in 2018, they introduced this computerized adaptive testing or CAPT based testing where the exam duration has been reduced to as little as just one hour. Depends on how well you're answering. 
you can finish the exam in just one hour. Maximum length is three hours and the number of questions can vary between 100 and 150. In order to pass the exam, you need to get a grade of 700 out of 1000, at least 70% in order to pass the exam. There are different domains in this exam. These are the eight domains of CISSP. What Ingram Micro we are doing is we are covering each of these domains as trainings, as weekly trainings, right? So this is part of our ongoing CISSP trainings that we are doing. And uh, today we are going to touch upon this particular domain called asset security, right? Now, what is the certification requirements? Passing the exam is the most difficult task about achieving CISSP status. But once you pass the exam, it doesn't mean you're a CISSP for life. You need to maintain your certification on an ongoing basis, which means you need to maintain CPE points. Every three years, at least 120 points have to be submitted and maintained. You also need to meet specific work experience requirements. Five years of work experience in at least two of the domains. Most of us um, would easily meet this requirement. If not, four years would be sufficient. If, for example, we already have a four year college degree, then in that case, only four years is sufficient. If you're passing the exam and you still don't have four years of work experience in cybersecurity, it doesn't matter. You can pass the exam and wait till you meet this work experience requirement. Maybe you need to wait one year, two years, it doesn't matter. Once you meet this uh, requirement, you just need to get yourself endorsed by an existing CSSP candidate, a CSSP member in good holding, good standing, and you get, you get the CSSP status for yourself. What are the objectives and the expectations from this training? Now, ladies and gentlemen, preparing for the CISSP, you've probably seen the textbooks, you've probably seen the study materials, the videos. The full-fledged CISSP exam preparation is something which you should give at least a dedicated uh, time of, you know, uh, 16 hours a day into 30 days, which is around 500 hours, I would say. At least 500 hours you need to prepare in focus, in, in deep focus for this exam. Today I'm going to cover one module within 45 to 50 minutes. Definitely this training is not going to get you ready for the exam and let's, let, let's be open about this. What we offer instead as part of our trainings is we offer detailed CISSP boot camps, detailed CISSP trainings where you come and we have a, a, you know, focused approach on tackling this exam, which is a five day activity. It's a five day uh, training that we offer and boot camps are even longer than five days, by the way. In today's training, what are we going to achieve? We will understand what is asset security domain of CSSP. We will understand what are the different contents, what are the different components of this particular domain and how we'll have to tackle them when it comes to the exam. That being said, let me also give you a, a heads up. Asset security is the easiest domain of the entire syllabus, which is why you must have seen earlier the weightage, exam weightage is only 10%. Uh, asset security as well as software development security, these two domains have only 10% exam weightage. The more difficult, the bigger domains, like for example, communications and network security, security risk management, these domains have 14 and 15% weightage respectively. Asset security is a, is, a, is a walk in the park compared to the remaining domains. So once you understand this particular domain, um, you wouldn't have to worry too much. It's, it's purely theoretical. Um, if you understand it once, if you read it twice or thrice, that's more than enough. You should be, you should be confident to tackle it for the exam. All right. Now with this background having been established, let's get into the slides. What really is asset security? This entire domain focuses on one specific section, which is collection, handling, and process protecting of data assets throughout the entire life cycle of data itself. So the objective of this particular domain is to understand how data can be kept secured throughout its entire life cycle. When it comes to securing data, there are different dimensions that we need to that we need to understand. 
these five domains or these five dimensions are what I have mentioned over here. Asset classification, privacy protection, data retention, data security controls, and secure data handling. We're going to start with each of these and cover them in today's training. When you read the textbook, by the way, whether you're following the official CISSP textbook from IRC Square or the Cybex textbook, which is also a very, very good textbook, these five subsections that you see here are what you will see in your textbook as well. These five subsections form the framework or the backbone of this entire module or domain. So let's start with asset classification, the very, very first one. What really is an IT asset? Now, when you think about ISO 27001, there are two types of assets. Uh, sorry, in ISO 27005, there are two types of assets, primary asset and supporting asset. Primary asset is considered to be data and supporting asset can be people, it can be processes, it can also be technologies. Now, those technologies are what, from the context of CSSP, we are considering it as IT assets. It can be hardware, it can be software, it can even be the data itself, as well as supporting physical infrastructure, like for example, cabling, um, ventilation, heating, and so on, as well as all the corresponding documentation pertaining to the management of these assets. Now, IT asset management is a terminology that we'll have to get familiar with. It's a series of business processes which will which are designed to manage the life cycle of the entire IT assets itself. A proper governance induced framework or a life cycle to ensure security is embedded across the entire life cycle of an IT asset. This is what IT asset management is. Some considerations we'll have to we'll have to think about when we are defining IT asset management framework. We need to understand a pro, we need to strike a proper balance between cost as well as need, because nobody has an infinite security budget. If your security budget is infinity, only then can your security risk be zero. Do you really need zero security risk? Not everybody can afford it. It's only a theoretical concept. So cost is a finite resource. Based on a risk-based approach, we'll have to define what are the controls, what are the security controls to protect an IT asset. We need to distinguish between who is a data owner and who is a data custodian. We will do that in the very next slide. We will have to secure private data. What is private data? In your textbook, you will see the definition of something called personally identifiable information. I know you are already familiar with this. Nevertheless, PII is any data which can be used to uniquely identify a natural living person. So it can be your name, it can be your date of birth, it can be one data or, or a bunch of um, uh, data sets which can be used to uniquely identify one person. You can say without an ounce of doubt, this data pertains to Mr. XYZ over here. This is private data or personal data. It has to be secured. We will look at this in the next domain where we talk about privacy. We also have to implement asset security to protect ourselves against any liabilities. Data has to be classified. What is data classification? We'll talk about this. And we have to understand what are the regulatory requirements based on the geography within which the organization is operational. So different considerations when it comes to asset management, right? Cost, individuals, data owners, data custodians, securing private data or personal data, so to speak. Um, implementing asset security for protection against liabilities, data classification, what is it? We will cover it now in a few slides, as well as policy requirements, regulatory landscape. Who are the different entities when it comes to asset management? Let me give you a very simple, straightforward example. This laptop from which I am presenting to you this particular session, this laptop is my company provided laptop, my company issued laptop. I cannot say that I am the owner of this laptop. Right, I'm the custodian of this particular laptop. The owner of this laptop happens to be the head of IT, for example, of my organization. The same concept you can apply to yourself as well for for respect for your laptops and so on. This concept, when you when you take it to an organizational um, environment, to an enterprise wide context. You will understand the difference between data owner and data custodian. 
the data owner is the individual or entity who is creating the data. He or she is responsible for creating it or he or she has acquired it from some other third party and he or she is defining how this data is going to be used. So the data owner knows the role that this data plays within the organization. Maybe this data is a, fi a firewall configuration. Maybe it is a it, it is a legal document. Maybe it is a piece of intellectual property, something which an organization developed themselves, like for example, source code of an application they developed, so on and so forth. The data owner knows what this data is. So he or she will say what are the security requirements of this data. He or she will say how this data which particular category this data falls under, right? The data custodian is an individual or an entity who is going to use this data. They are not the individuals who determine how this data is going to be used, rather they will be using it. And in so doing, they need to comply with the do's and don'ts set out by the data owner. The data owner says this data is confidential. It falls under category C1 confidential of our organization which means it should not be shared outside the company. So the data custodian has to follow it. Going back to my earlier example, I'm using my company laptop. Company policy tells me I am not supposed to plug in USB sticks. I'm not supposed to um, disable the antivirus, so on and so forth. So I have to ensure that I'm using this laptop in alignment with my organization policy. This is my role as a custodian of this laptop. Similarly, the data custodian has to ensure the data is properly protected as per the requirements defined by the data owner. There are two other associated definitions, system owner as well as business owner. System owner is an individual or an entity who is owning the IT infrastructure. We are talking here from a technology perspective, not from a data perspective. Maybe different from the data owner. For example, the IT department will own the servers, whereas sales department or marketing department, they own the data which is residing on those servers. So you need to separate data from the technology infrastructure. You have data owner as well as system owner. Similarly, you can have a system custodian, which is the case of this laptop that I told you about. Business owner. These are individuals or entities who own an entire business process or at least a part of it. They define what goes on through this particular business process. What are the different steps involved? Who are the individuals and what is the sensitivity from a security perspective of this business process itself? All right. Next one is asset labeling and classification principles. What really is data classification? Now, every time you you create a confidential document within your organization or you've received one, for example, you you've definitely seen it has a document control section where it has a version, the author, the date, um, the, the date on which it was written, the date on which it was reviewed and so on. You'll also find a section which says classification. This is exactly what data classification is all about. Any organization with a mature security program, they need to have a data classification scheme in place. There are multiple tools today which can help you to perform data classification. For example, there is a tool from a vendor called Bolden James. This is outside of your CSSP scope. I'm just mentioning from a practical perspective. Bolden James, their tools will help you to perform data classification automatically. If you prefer to go with a manual approach, it's a service that a lot of organizations offer, including Ingram Micro Cyber Security. We offer data classification services also. What is data classification? It identifies a value of the data to the organization, and it is a process that will protect the data confidentiality as well as integrity. So you identify the system owner or the data owner defines this data falls under category C1, C2 or confidential, critical, and so on. The organization should have a schema for different criticality ratings of data, and data owners, they will have to map the data that they create to this respective schema. Like I mentioned earlier, if you create a new document or you've created a piece of IP, which is a source code, you need to categorize it as confidential, sensitive, or unclassified, depends on the case. Not only that, you'll also have to label the data. When you label it, this is when data custodians who use the data, they will understand what security classification this data falls under and they know how to handle the data securely as well. When you're labeling the data, you should also ensure the sensitivity level, the purpose, the value, the criticality, and who's the owner of the asset itself. If there's any clarifications or questions, they can come back to the owner and check with them. 
what is the process that organizations have to follow when they are classifying assets? Very, very simple flowchart. First of all, identify the data asset itself. Understand who is accountable for securing it. Clearly establish the ownership of the asset and then classify the asset by putting a value on it. It's bullet point number four. Have a schema for classifying the asset and implement this classification schema. Very straightforward process. There is something called a data classification policy. Organizations have to have this policy which clearly dictates what are the different classification levels that the organization has. And it also tells you what are the criteria based on the basis of which the data has to be classified. If this data has significant business value to the organization, if this data, when it falls into the wrong hands, like for example, a competitor, it can have a negative impact on our on our competitive edge in the market. If this data, the time that we spent on developing this data um, was so high, it exceeded 500 man hours, for example, then this data is to be classified as critical. If this data is good from a marketing perspective, you can publish it on a website, you can publish it on Facebook, social media, etc. This data can be classified as unclassified or unprotected public data, for example. So these criteria that I just mentioned, all of this have to be clearly mentioned in your data classification policy. Apart from this, it should also tell you what are the respective security protection levels required for each category. Critical data should be encrypted. It should not be forwarded outside the company. It should not be stored for longer than n number of years, so on and so forth. All of these security requirements have to be clearly laid out in your data classification policy. Lastly, it should also mention who are the different roles and what are the different roles and responsibilities, who are the different individuals, who is a data owner, who is a data custodian, and so on and so forth. In your textbook, ladies and gentlemen, you will find two examples of data classification schemes. One is from a military classification perspective, and the other one is for commercial organizations. Now, when I say military, this of course pertains to the US military because CSSP, the syllabus is very, very aligned with what you see within US organizations, including public sector, government, as well as military uh, sectors. So within the US military, data is classified as top secret, secret, confidential, and lastly, unclassified. Different categories have different risks if the data is compromised. There is a grave damage to national security or serious damage or just damage. And lastly, there is no damage at all. So what is the difference between grave, serious damage and so on? This is clearly laid out as per the policies that the organizations are following. Early from a commercial perspective, for profit organizations typically can follow these terminologies of this particular schema that you see over here. Corporate confidential information not to be shared outside of the corporate. Personal and confidential information. Private and lastly trade secret and so on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we've completed the an overview of the asset classification section of asset security module or domain. The next domain or, or subdomain that we're going to look at is privacy. Now, privacy is a concept which has picked up a lot of lot of interest globally just within the last two to three years. The main reason or the main uh, catalyst for it has been the onslaught of GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, which came about in 2018. And just within the last two years, it has globally impacted the way in which organizations are perceiving as well as doing something about privacy. What really do you mean by privacy, ladies and gentlemen? Let me try to very, very simply put it out for you. Um, when cybersecurity started to become a subject, uh, a subject matter of grave interest, not only to people, but also to companies, uh, as well as to um, nation states and governments itself, what we are trying to achieve in cybersecurity is we are trying to protect the data that we have entrusted with organizations. We are trying to protect this data from unknown hackers. In privacy, we are trying to protect ourselves, the people, from the 
for profit corporations from the established organizations of the world itself. So the enemy here is not these unknown hackers like we see in the case of cybersecurity. In privacy, the enemy is companies that we know, we trust, and with whom we have given, to whom we have given all of our personal data. So this can be a company as large as, for example, the big tech organizations, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so on. Or it can be your um, this mom and pop shop just down the street. Every time you go down to um, purchase something, they tell you, can you give me your phone number? And then they use this phone number to market their products to you and you start receiving SMS messages all of a sudden from unknown numbers without your knowledge. They collected your phone number for one reason and then they're using it for something else. How much control do you and I as individuals have over our own personal data? This is what privacy is all about. The textbook definition of privacy is being in a state of solitude or in a group of other people with a group of other people where you're not being monitored without your own knowledge, where you're not uh, being the subject of surveillance without your own knowledge. This is what privacy is all about. Different countries, in fact, 80 plus countries around the world have already enforced some sort of privacy legislation or the other. Some of the regions that you see over here, Europe with GDPR, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE and Kuwait, all the GCC countries as well have got a lot of privacy laws across different parts of the jurisdiction. Just let me add over here, UAE, we don't yet have a federal privacy law, but we have privacy laws for Dubai International Financial Center, DIFC, data protection law, and for other such smaller spheres within the country. Bahrain has a national data protection law. Kuwait is expecting uh, something to be out very soon and so on. In the US, of course, we have a lot of privacy laws as well as those pertaining to spe specific states like CCPA pertains only to the state of California. And Canada has something called PIPEDA, which is Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. All right. Similarly, in the APAC region, we have Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, as well as India who have their own privacy laws applicable at a federal or a national level. Each of these privacy laws, what do they seek to achieve? They seek to hold organizations accountable for the protection of personal data that they collect from data subjects, from individuals within these respective jurisdictions. Now, when we look at privacy, there are a lot of legal challenges for organizations. Organizations have to have a framework or a roadmap to ensure they are complying with these applicable laws within their respective countries where they are where they are performing business. So when I say frameworks, they should define what data they are collecting. This is what we call material scoping. They need to define what data they are collecting. After that, they should also define how long will this collected data be held, which is nothing but data retention period. They need to also define how are we going to secure this data? What are the data security requirements? This is a, this is the one line which tells you security is a subset of privacy. Privacy is not a subset of security because your data can still be secured, but doesn't mean your data, your privacy requirements have been met. Right? How will data be shared? Who are you going to share it with and so on? And lastly, once the data has reached its end of life, how are you going to delete it securely? These are some of the questions that organizations have to address when they are having a privacy program or a privacy framework for their organization. Like I mentioned earlier, 80 plus countries all over the world, they have some sort of privacy law or the other. And these laws are designed to protect citizens, residents of these respective countries from their data being misused, from their privacy being intruded upon without their knowledge, without their consent, and so on. Now, some laws may reduce privacy protections in the interest of national security. I'll give you the example of GDPR itself, ladies and gentlemen. Now, GDPR, we already know this, it's the toughest privacy regulation in the, in the world, right? Complying with GDPR is not a mean feat. It is very, very detailed, very, very elaborate. And of course, the fines, you also know this, the fines are very, very stringent. They are very heavy. Uh, going up to the tune of 10, 20 million euro. 
or two or four percent of your total worldwide annual turnover, depending upon the, the gravity of the violation itself. Now, that being said, even in a law as tough as GDPR, you will see that national security and public safety takes precedence over the protection of one person's privacy. You will see a lot of exceptions that tell you if there is a risk to the national security, if there is a requirement for the enforcement of law, law enforcement agencies, LEAs, as we call them in GDPR, then there is an exception to the protection of people's privacy. So when GDPR itself does it, there is no doubt other laws will also emulate the same principles. Protection of national security takes precedence over the protection of individuals' privacy. Now, question which comes to us when we talk about privacy, and the answer to this should have been obvious to us by now, who is the owner of personally identifiable information or private data? Definitely, the answer is the individual itself, the person to, about whom the data is, the person to whom the data pertains, the so-called data subject. This means when a hospital is holding personal information, health information pertaining to 500 patients that, that it has attended to within the last one month, it does not mean they are the data owner. Those 500 patients, those patients are the owners of the data. The hospital is a so-called data controller and they have to realize that particular role that they play. They determine the purpose and the means of this data processing, but they are not the owner of the data. So organizations, they should realize this role that they are playing and they need to have specific protections in order to ensure this data is, is, is secured, the privacy of the individual is upheld, and not just going out and outright using the data just to derive business value out of it. Like, for example, sharing it with a, with a telemarketing company or sharing it with a data analytics company. By the way, a lot of, lot of established organizations in the world, they do this today as part of business as usual activities, including the popular social media platforms. What is the role of data controllers and data processors? So understanding that they don't own the data is step one. What is step two? They need to perform specific do's and don'ts in order to protect those individuals' privacy. In GDPR, these do's and don'ts are entrenched within the seven founding principles of GDPR itself. Data should be lawfully and fairly processed. Data should be processed only for specific limited purposes. Data should be adequate, relevant and not excessive. It should be accurate, not, not retained for longer than necessary, protect processed basis on the basis of data subjects rights, secured and transferred only to those countries with adequate protection. What does each of these mean, ladies and gentlemen, very, very quickly? When I say lawfully processed, if a company is collecting your data with the intention of using it to launch a cyber attack against you, that's of course an illegal basis of processing your personal data. It would not be valid under GDPR. The purpose for which the data is being collected, it should be lawful. It should be a legal requirement. Like for example, performance of a business contract or a transaction which is entirely legal. Process for limited purposes. These, the purpose for which the data is collected should be specified and it should be limited. I'm collecting your data to sell you something. Later on, I should not use your data in order to market something else to you. The data should be adequate. It should have proper quality. It should not be excessive and it should also be accurate. It should have a proper uh, retention period, which is defined. And there is something called data subjects rights, which pertains to your right to object to processing, the right to withdraw consent, the right to um, be forgotten, so on and so forth. There are seven or eight such rights that data subjects have under, for example, GDPR, and these rights have to be upheld throughout the life cycle of the data. Lastly, data has to be secured in terms of confidentiality, integrity, as well as availability. If you're transferring the data to an outside country, when I say outside country from a GDPR perspective, it applies to those countries outside of the EU, the European Union. Make sure it's transferred only to those countries which have adequate protection or 
on the basis of other transferring criteria that GDPR has included, like for example, BCRs, um, um, appropriate uh, codes of conduct, and so on and so forth. Appropriate safeguards and codes of conduct. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so this brings us to a close of the section on privacy. By the way, if you have questions, feel free, please just type them into the chat window. We'll take them up at the end of today's session. We're jumping now to the third part, which is data retention. What do I mean by retention? Retention is the act of storing a business asset in order to satisfy a business need. So I'm holding on to an asset for a specific period of time, and this time is defined based on the business value that this asset holds for me. Assets that may be retained include data, media, hardware, software, as well as personnel. Now, very quickly, we're going to go over each of these. One slide for each of these. We'll start with data retention. We know that data is, of course, the new oil, the most important asset that organizations have today. It's cheap for an organization to lose a laptop, but not the data that is held in that laptop. That is more valuable than the laptop itself. This was not the case, let's say, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Situations have changed right now. The data is of more value than the um, as, than the asset that holds it itself. Different data requires different retention durations. For example, financial records might be need to be might need to be retained for up to seven years. It depends upon the country, depends upon the law uh, prevailing within that respective country itself. Other types of data may need to be disposed of quickly, even if only after a few months. Even if the data is not privacy related, still consider it in the context of retention. Now, in data retention, what we're doing is we will have to define what is a business retention period of a particular piece of data, and we'll have to follow it to the T, which means every quarter we'll have to, for example, scan all of our technology um, assets to see if there's any piece of data that we're retaining. If the duration has ex has been exceeded, we were supposed to retain this piece of data only for three months, but we have held on to it for the last one year. We have to find a way to securely delete it. What do I mean by secure deletion? We will cover that in today's upcoming section. Now, this scenario that I just mentioned is exactly what we are doing in PCI DSS requirement three. There is something called data retention duration when it comes to cardholder data, which PCI is all about. Every quarter, we are required to scan our network to check if there's any card data that we are retaining. We should have defined a retention period for this card data. Card data being cardholder name, card, card number, the 15 or 16 digit credit card or debit card number. And if we've exceeded the retention period, we'll have to find a way to securely delete it. What is secure deletion? I repeat, we will cover that in one of the upcoming slides today. Media retention. Media is, of course, the storage device itself of the um, of the data. It can be a USB, it can be a flash drive and so on. Some best practices when it comes to retention of media devices, you need to ensure that they are serving their purpose during their useful lifetime, which means they should not be spoiled. They should not be damaged when they are required from a business perspective. In order to achieve this, make sure they are protected from environmental factors like heat, light and so on and so forth. When you've kept keeping it in a locked safe, include some silica gel packs because they will absorb the moisture in the air and prevent moisture mildew so on to get from getting deposited on the um, on the storage device itself. Keep magnetic media away from magnetic fields. If you're using, for example, um, a hard disk, the magnet, which of course is based on magnetism, or you're still using one of the old days floppy disks. Please keep them away from magnetic fields. When you're using backup tapes, have a proper life cycle that is documented and managed for these backup tapes. Also, if these tapes are being transferred to, for example, an off-site facility, the, the DR site, for example, let's say, make sure that you have a media movement tracker. You need to have barcodes through which the, the movement of media devices is being tracked regularly. Have a list of people who are authorized to carry out backup processes, access the media devices and so on. This is in order to ensure that these media devices are not misused, they're not mishandled by malicious individuals or those who are just not trained enough 
on handling them. One is hardware, and then we'll look at software. Maintain old hardware so that you can still retrieve the data that is present on these hardware devices, um, even when they are needed beyond their life cycle, uh, beyond their lifetime, sorry. Create a retention plan that focuses on the entire life cycle and dispose hardware devices which are no longer needed. Again, when you're disposing it, perform secure deletion of the data. If required, make sure that you'll have to go to the extent of physical um, destruction of the hardware devices itself to ensure the data is not um, retrieved in future. When I say hardware, think about firewalls, think about routers, um, think about typical networking components, SIM appliances, SIEM appliances, um, eight and firewall packet inspection devices, so on and so forth. All of these devices, they will still hold their configurations. They will still hold sensitive data of the organization even beyond their lifetime. So you need to think about how the data is going to be deleted and not misused or retrieved by uh, unauthorized individuals after the lifetime of the hardware device. When it comes to software, the next slide, you have two types. Either you developed it in-house or you purchased it as a commercial off-the-shelf application. In both cases, there is something called application lifecycle or software lifecycle itself, which is the lifetime of the application after it has been deployed, after it has been put into production use. What does What is the process of it being adopted, being used, being updated, and then finally being retired at the end of its lifetime? When you're going to retire this particular software, you might need to invest in special scrubbing of the data. Just uninstalling the application might not be sufficient. You might probably need to buy additional applications that will find and retrieve, for example, old screenshots, uh, cache data, etc., which the software has created, uh, logs, application logs, which again can have a lot of sensitive data in them. This data has to be tracked, it has to be identified, and has to be securely deleted. Just uninstalling the application will not be sufficient. The last one is, of course, people. And this is a very um, tricky subject because we're talking about data being retained in people's minds. You have, for example, data that is trapped within specific departments. A lot of organizations struggle with these so-called knowledge silos. Intentionally or unintentionally, people tend to safeguard the knowledge that they have on how, for example, an application works, how a particular business process is carried out, and they don't want to share this information with their colleagues. This could be um, risky from the organization's security perspective. For example, if this individual quits, you would be left in a, in a weak position. Or if this individual decides to go rogue and carries out some attack against the organization, we would not know how he carried it out. Right. We'll have to bring in specialized expertise to investigate what he did, he or she. So avoid depending on single people for especially critical business processes. Include knowledge transfer provisions across different departments. Include rotation of duties. You will see this terminology um, in CISSP multiple times. Rotation of duties in order to ensure that any suspicious inside activity which is uh, cooking up people will be deterred from uh, carrying these out because they will have the fear that they will be caught very very significant especially from the financial sector and banks mandatory vacations job rotations are mandatory for example within the financial sector every year you have to take annual leave for one month or whatever two weeks or so on so that someone else does your job during this time and if you're carrying out any fraud during this time it will come to light so this is also a best practice to protect information from being concentrated within specific knowledge silos. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we've completed um, this particular domain, this particular subdomain as well, which was data retention. We're now jumping over to the next one where we're going to look at data security controls. Now, when it comes to data security controls, what are security controls? Data security controls are mechanisms or means that are developed and implemented to ensure the data is protected in terms of confidentiality, integrity and availability. When you're selecting a control, you need to have specific considerations. You need to think about data standards. 
baselines, scoping and tailoring, and then how to implement a specific control. Right? So in order to do this, let's first of all understand what is a data standard. A data standard is an agreement between different organizations on data formats. For example, X.25 format certificates are being created. Digital certificates are created in this particular format. When you have SSL version 1.3 or TLS version 1.4, these are specific formats within which data is to be compliant or is, data is to be um, encoded so that it can be used by different devices. There is interoperability across these devices, across these platforms, even across competing organizations. PDF is a simple data standard. It is usable worldwide. Data standards, they help vendors to implement consistent security across their products. So when you're designing a security control for a piece of data, first of all, start by standardizing the data itself. So when you know that this particular data is in PDF format, these are the risks pertaining to PDF files. These are the risks pertaining to Word documents, macros, for example. So accordingly, you can select the most appropriate controls. OK, so start by sanitizing your data, complying with um, sorry, complying with specific data standards. The next one is baselines. Now, when it comes to designing of controls, sky is the limit. Depending upon my budget, I can go to the extent of completely locking down my data. Of course, nobody wants to do this because it, it, it would be redundancy. It would be inefficient use of finances. Where do you start? Baseline is the answer. Baseline defines a minimum baseline or minimum standard of protection that is required for a piece of data. And when I say piece of data, what do I mean by piece of data? You have different classifications. Exactly. You need to go back to your data classification schema. I have different pieces of data which fall under public, private, sensitive, confidential, trade secret, these categories. We already have this clearly defined in our data classification policy that we saw earlier today. For public information, this is the baseline. It is recommended that it be kept read only. Encryption is optional. Data redundancy is optional. Media dispos disposal or sanitation is recommended so it is recommended as a baseline that if it's public data you apply these controls read only as well as media sanitation the others encryption data or redundancy are optional whereas if it's a trade secret a minimum baseline is making it read only applying encryption data or redundancy media sanitation this is a minimum baseline that is required for trade secret so you should have a proper mapping across the data classification schema talking about different controls and whether they are recommended, whether they are optional and so on and so forth. This is exactly what a baseline is all about. All right, so you started with defining what are data standards. You try to standardize the data. Then you jumped into data baselines, which is where you start by defining your controls, the minimum baseline of your controls itself. How do you perform a scoping and how do you perform a tailoring of the controls? This is the next activity that you need to look about look think about when i say scoping it pertains to the particular reach over that your particular controls have to have over your data i'm talking about data that exists throughout the city of dubai this means my scope is the city of dubai i want to only scope in my data center which is located in abu dhabi as well as a head office which is located in fujairah so in this particular case only these two buildings, the local head office as well as the data center is the scope. So which particular boundaries do you want to include for your security controls? This is exactly what scoping is all about. It can be a city, it can be a building, it can be a business process or it can be a particular device, a particular section of your network. It can even be just one or two people. Right. So based on the scope, you can determine what are the best controls. If you're talking about a building, you'll need to think about, first of all, the building uh, premise security itself. Whereas if you're talking only about a, a particular network segment, you will be focused more on the technical controls. Physical security controls are included as well, but 
your focus should be more on the technical controls, like let's apply perimeter protection for this particular segment. Let's have a firewall here, let's have an IPS there, and let's collect logs, so on and so forth. Based on the scope, you will have to tailor. This is exactly what tailoring is all about. If it's a building, we'll focus more on the physical security controls. If it is a network, we will go with more technical controls. OK. Lastly, go out and start implementing your controls. When you're implementing your controls, you need to design them. You need to implement them around confidentiality, integrity, as well as availability of your data itself. Ensure data is visible only to authorized eyes, which means go for encryption, go for hashing, um, so on and so forth. Integrity again is also implemented by hashing. Ensure that um, data is modifiable only by the authorized entities. Lastly, availability, which means make sure data is available when people need it, which means go for backup mechanisms, depend on a cloud service provider, if at all that's an option, so on and so forth. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so this brings us to the final subdomain for today, which is secure handling of data. So just to recap all the different domains that we that we covered today as part of asset security, we started with classification of data. We looked at asset classification or data classification. We looked at military. We looked at commercial classification schemas, and then we jumped into privacy because we need to understand the privacy requirements for different governments, for different organizations. We looked at organizations role as data controllers and data processors to protect the privacy of their customers, right? After that, we looked at data retention and we looked at how you can have data which is um, stored on media devices, it's stored on hardware, it's stored in software as well as even in people's minds. How do you retain this data based on business requirements and how do you ensure it is deleted at the end of this? defined business uh, time period or duration. Then we looked at controls. We looked at security controls. We said let's start with this data itself. We looked at what is a data standard, how we can standardize the format of the data, and then we looked at data baselines, which is where you start, which is where you start designing your controls. After that, we looked at scoping and tailoring. Scoping is the boundaries across which your controls have to be applied. And tailoring is when the controls are tailored to the specific scoped environment. Lastly, we looked at control implementation itself, where you're looking at protection of confidentiality, integrity, as well as availability. Now, the final subdomain for today is secure handling of data. And in, in this particular domain, we are going to look first at data security policies. Any organization which is having a decent information security program or framework, they will have an information security policy. This policy will talk about different aspects of the security program, including management's responsibilities, the organization's accountability, um, incident response or incident management policies, different roles, responsibilities of the security team, um, how to actually um, classify different assets and so on and so forth. Apart from that, these points from a data security pro uh, perspective have to be included within your policy. How is the data going to be classified? Where is it going to be stored? Who will need access? How will you monitor? How long will you retain it? So on and so forth. When it comes to data handling, Secure handling will ensure that data is secured throughout its entire life cycle. This little um, arrow over here, or this little smart art shows you data across different, the different phases of data across its entire life cycle. Delivery, storage, archival, finally disposition of the data itself. Data has to be handled securely across each of these different phases of its lifetime. Some controls to keep in mind or some factors to keep in mind. Cost, ownership, privacy, legal liabilities, sensitivity, legal requirements, policies, procedures, and so on. There's something called marking. You've classified your data. You have a data classification scheme. 
And now you're spreading the data across the organization. You've circulated the data for people to use it, which means you've given it to data custodians. Where will they refer to find out what this data classification level is? As a data owner, you will need to classify the data, which is exactly what you're doing when you mark it. Marking or labeling of data ensures that users can easily identify the classification level of the data itself. I gave you an example earlier today of the document control section within documents like sensitive documents. You will see the version, the author, the date and so on. And you'll also see something called classification level. It is C1 confidential or C2. It is sensitive or C3. It is public, so on and so forth. So this act of marking the data or labeling it is exactly what we're talking about over here. It helps even automated applications to appropriately secure the data. It informs employees on how to handle that data. And the data owner is the person who will perform the marking. The data custodian he simply applies it. Common marking practices. You can go for watermarking. You can apply label if it's, for example, a backup tape. You will always have to include the name and the address of the individual group or so on who has set that particular marking. So if there's any questions or any queries, they can get back to this particular individual or the group itself. Also the date, it was marked confidential on this particular date. And use redundant marking on the front, the cover, the title page, the footer, the header and so on and so forth. Ensure that the marking is, is etched in stone. It cannot be modified by somebody who wants to perform a malicious activity. Labels are the mechanisms that are used to mark your data. All right. Labels should make the classification very obvious to the observer. It's not like he has to go out looking for it. They should be very out there, very, very clearly and explicitly evident to the data custodian itself. So the asset owner will document the security classification. He will advise the asset security and the IT security team on this. Hard copies should be clearly labeled. If it's a hard bound, uh, if it's a bound hard copy, include the sensitivity level on the front cover, the rear cover and so on. Fax sheets should also have the classification. Emails or any other sort of electronic communications should also have the proper classification, which means applying digital rights management or using DLP tools when it comes to soft copies of your data. Unlabeled data should have the highest priority until a label can be assigned. Security by default, right? At the end of its lifetime, how do you delete your data? Just pressing shift and delete, this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, ladies and gentlemen, but this is not sufficient to ensure the data is not irretrievable. Even if you just shift delete a file, it is still there on the hard disk until that particular sector of your hard disk is used to store another file this particular file can very very easily be retrieved even that but if that particular sector has been overwritten maybe once it can still be retrieved by a trained forensic examiner in order to avoid all of these problems you need to ensure that you're going for something called secure data destruction or secure data deletion there are five methods that you see over here the first one is simply erasure. You can delete the data or shift delete it. It does not fully remove the data. Data can still be recovered as we know. What you can do otherwise is clearing or overwriting. In clearing, you will have to deliberately fill up all the different addressable locations of your hard disk with random data, which is random ones, random zeros, and so on. Like I said earlier, when you just shift delete, if a particular sector of your hard disk is still not reused by a new file for storing something, that file, the original file that you initially shift deleted, can easily be retrieved. What you need to do is deliberately overwrite it with ones and zeros multiple times. Several rounds have to be carried out. This is one of the ways of ensuring the original file is not retrieved. This is not the best way, by the way. Purging is when you go for extreme clearing or extreme overwriting. You perform multiple levels of clearing, multiple levels of overwriting. It's immediately called purging. It's a little more secure than clearing itself. The next option is decaussing. 
If you remember, ladies and gentlemen, earlier today I told you when you're protecting your hardware devices from a retention period, make sure if you're using magnetic hard disks, magnetic floppy drives, keep them away from magnetic fields because they can get corrupted when exposed to magnetic flux. But what if you want to deliberately damage the data that is stored on these devices and make it irretrievable? This is what degaussing is all about. Magnetic media devices like hard disks, floppy devices and floppy disks and so on, they will be subject to a strong magnetic field as a result of which they are completely useless. You can't, you can't use them to even read data in future. All right, they've been corrupt completely. Of course, degaussing will not work against optical storage devices like CDs, solid state drives and so on. The last option is simply physical destruction where you take a hammer and simply destroy the storage device. Of course, it's the best way because it can't be used at all. But think about the fact that cost is also a constraint. You can't go out and simply just physically destroy all the hard disks. You might have to reuse them as well. So one of the better ways, better options is to go for purging because it is fairly secure and you can still reuse the, the, the storage media. Now, something called data remnants even after erasure of data you might still find some information remaining as residual information left as magnetic flux on storage devices this is what we call data remnants and this can be reused by unauthorized individuals to retrieve the data in this case if your degaussing is not giving you 100% security, just go for physical destruction of the media devices. Another scenario where data remnants is of consideration is cloud service providers. Even from a privacy perspective, you have something called right to be forgotten, which means if I apply my right to be forgotten to Google, Google is required to delete all of my data that they hold about me. How can you be sure that they have done it holistically? We can't go out there and audit their servers. So this remains a gray area. That was it, ladies and gentlemen, from an asset security perspective. To recap once again, we started in a very, very simple way with an introduction to the module itself. We started with data classification. We looked at privacy. We looked at data retention. And then we looked at data security controls. And lastly, we looked at how to securely handle data throughout its life cycle. I really hope the session was useful and it, and it motivated you to prepare harder for your exams, for your CISSP. I hope it also inspired you to, to sit for the exam sooner rather than later. Now, if you have any questions, this is where we'll take them. Please feel free to type them into the chat window and we will definitely um, uh, address them. If not, I'm available on email, the same email cyber.meta at ingrammicro.com. You can get in touch with us through this particular email ID and we're more than happy to be in touch with you as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate uh, your compliment. Um, Mr. Faisaluddin Sheikh, absolutely, sir. The session is fully recorded and uh, it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. I will type in the, the uh, YouTube channel uh, the name as well. It's just Ingram Micro Cybersecurity. When you look, for, look it up, you will easily find us on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marie, Ma, Marina. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I, I take it you don't have any questions, but of course we are always accessible. And let me remind you, we also conduct this as a five day CISSP workshop or training and, and a boot camp as well, which goes to beyond five days as up to, uh, up to as much as 10 days. We are here to support you on your CISSP journey. Feel free to collaborate with us. Thank you so much, and I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Thank you.